we are going to be having a show today on a couple of topics. Uh, the United States Supreme Court decision in the McGirt, MC, capital G-I-R-T, case that we talked about a couple of weeks ago before the decision by the court had been made. Also, we're going to be talking with Mike McBride, our guest today, uh, about the, uh, the recent uh, Oklahoma decisions uh, between the state of Oklahoma and the Indian tribes on gaming contracts. Uh, Mick, how you been? Oh, I, I've been good, but I think you're right, Ken, and, and uh, this is a very topical show. Two major victories uh, for the tribes there in the courts. And I, I'm interested to hear what Mike thinks and how this, uh, you know, creates a new chapter for Oklahoma going forward. Yeah, folks, we're going to be visiting with Mike McBride again after the break uh, about uh, several uh, Indian gaming matters, uh, as well as uh, the tribal sovereignty matters. This is Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. You're watching The Verdict. We will be right back. I've always been a public servant. I've served either tribes, I've served the federal government, or I've served state governments. The law allows me to express my natural desire to advocate. My name is Stephanie Cochran. I am an attorney and I am Chickasaw. Lawyers give their clients, and in my case, tribal governments, a voice. I and mean, it's through legal decisions that tribes have been able to accomplish and to regain some much lost footing that they encountered in the late 1800s and the 1900s. When I reflect back on this time in history, I think I will look at it in terms of opportunity. And I think now we have to turn those opportunities into long-term success for our future generations. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. One of the best kept secrets about the Post-911 GI Bill benefit is that it can be used at a trade school or a technical school, and it doesn't have to be used at a university or college. These are benefits that the veterans have earned through their service, and they should take advantage of it. Veterans really need to understand that there are many resources offered by the Oklahoma Department of Veteran Affairs. They are there to help you find the right school for you the school that will help you and your family make great steps into your future. The Vet Hero Office at the University of Central Oklahoma, it is a one-stop shop for veterans when they're trying to get their education. I call it my encore job. I get to take care of veterans. We help them transition. I was that guy that transitioned after 24 years, and in the end, GI Bill is a benefit that those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines earned. It was the thing that made us the greatest country in the world coming out of World War II, and it will continue to do the same thing for this future generation of service members. Welcome back, uh, Kent Myers and Mick Cornett, uh, joining you this Sunday morning on The Verdict. As we indicated in our opening segment, our guest today is Mike McBride. He has come back uh, to do another show with us uh, on uh, a topic that he uh, visited with us about last time. Uh, the McGirt decision was pending in the United States Supreme Court uh last time we had mike on and now the decision has been made and its implications are now being felt in oklahoma also there have been a couple of uh, uh, interesting both state and federal court decisions dealing with the tribal gaming contracts in oklahoma or compacts i should say in oklahoma and those decisions are, are quite recent that we're going to be visiting with mike about uh, Mike uh, is a recognized uh, Indian law expert. He's one of my partners. I'm proud to say that. Uh, he is uh, also a general counsel uh, for the Seminole Nation, I believe. And uh, he has had uh, 25 to 30 years of actual hands-on experience in tribal matters uh, of all sorts and is a leading, uh, actually, he's a leading national expert not simply a regional or local expert 
Uh, Mike, sure glad to have you. Thanks for coming back to visit with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, folks. Yeah, Mike, when the Supreme Court uh, uh, ruled in favor of the tribes in the McGirt case, uh, you saw all sorts of reactions uh, the following day. Some people saying uh, everything changed, and other people were saying, well, the day-to-day -day lives, the day-to-day -day happenings really aren't going to change. So which is it? How, how much of a, of, a, of a change for the people that live in Oklahoma will the McGirt case uh, signify? Well, I believe that there was a, a fair amount of misinformation in the press. And well, let's straighten it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to believe that it's not going to be such a monumental change in the lives of the average Oklahomans. And be you a tribal citizen or uh, a non-Indian Oklahoma citizen, the tribal citizens are Oklahoma citizens as well. And uh, McGirt is certainly one of the most important decisions in the history of Oklahoma for tribes and for state sovereignty. But um, I think that a lot of things will be worked out. Well, uh, what is different? Well, let's start with McGirt. McGirt mm -hmm. um, ruled that the Major Crimes Act applied to his crimes and therefore the state of Oklahoma didn't have jurisdiction. Mr. McGirt was uh, convicted of uh, sexually molesting a four, four-year-old uh, granddaughter of his wife in Broken Arrow, and he's a Seminole uh, Indian, and he claimed throughout uh, that he was Indian and that his uh, crime happened on the Indian reservation, so Oklahoma shouldn't have jurisdiction. The Major Crimes Act is a federal law that provides for exclusive federal jurisdiction and federal court for the major crimes, and then concurrent jurisdiction also lies for the, the tribe, but, but no state jurisdiction. So what that the immediate impact of this case is that um, to get to that holding, the Supreme Court had to look at, did the Creek Nation reservation still exist or not? Was it disestablished? Did Congress write a law that wiped it out? Or was it wiped out through the practice of, of history and so forth? And ultimately to get that to that conclusion, the Supreme Court said, no, it's still there. Um, the, uh, the Major Cr Crimes Act applies, it happened in Indian country, therefore um, crimes involving Indians will have to be prosecuted either in federal court for major crimes or in tribal court for the- So Mike, if, if a similar crime happened tomorrow in that same jurisdiction in Broken Arrow, w would the events that then transpired afterward be different today or tomorrow than they were uh, back when the McGirt case began? You would still have investigation by the uh, local law enforcement agency, and that wouldn't change. And there would be cooperation between, say, the city of Broken Arrow or the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office. But they would also call on the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which would be the, the lead agency uh, for investigating. And then it would be turned over to the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office if it, if it involved a Native American uh, under the definition of the Major Crimes Act. And that's where it'd be prosecuted. I can tell you that since this has happened, uh, the Eastern District of Oklahoma and the Northern District of Oklahoma U.S. Attorney's Office have uh, ramped up uh, with extra staff. They've uh, the Department of Justice has made a call, and I, I think that they're planning on bringing in uh, upwards of nearly a hundred um, extra assistant U.S. attorneys and legal assistants to help with uh, the next six months to sort through this. So um, there, there will be some more federal resources, but you're not gonna see a lot of change in uh, prosecutions and, uh, and investigations. I, I think that'll go on. It's just a matter of rebalancing and allocating between the, the agencies. Mike, let me ask you, um, the um, new or I should say temporary uh, U.S. attorneys that will be coming in. Will they be based in Tulsa or Oklahoma City or both? Um, they would be based out of uh, Muskogee, where the Eastern District of Oklahoma is, and uh, Tulsa, where the Northern District is. Now, the McGirt case right now only applies to the Muskogee Creek Nation Reservation, which is a, um, I believe, 11 county area, about 3 million acres. It includes most of Metro uh, Tulsa, um, and, but 
the, the case, I, I think all legal experts agree, would could soon apply to the other four of the five tribes, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, Seminole, in addition to the Muscogee Creek. So they have very, very similar treaty provisions. So it's believed that, um, you know, with the right cases, that, that those could apply there. And since the cases come down, we've had a, a number of lawsuits that have, that have been filed in state and federal court. I'm looking at one filed in Mogi County by, um, it's called Nicholson and a few others versus Kevin Stitt and a, and a bunch of uh, district attorneys for people that were convicted in state court trying to uh, get their, their fees back, saying that they were wrongfully uh, convicted. And there was also a similar one filed in United States District Court for the Northern District of Oklahoma here in Tulsa that involves Cherokee citizens. So some of those cases may bring up the issue of, uh, you know, the application of, of those other treaties uh, sooner rather than later. Is, Let me is, ask you, I'm so, no, go ahead, Mick. You go well, ahead. I, I was going to ask, is, is the McGirt case broader than this one case? Or, I mean, could it be expanded um, by uh, future um, um, uh, legal action that takes place in these other lawsuits that you're talking about? Might it might these additional ones require the Supreme Court to come back in and and expand its its uh, previous ruling? That that's right, Nick. Um, there are a lot of unanswered questions, and and it has you know left some uncertainty, and I, and I think it it has raised some alarms and, and fear amongst uh, Oklahoma citizens about you know what's happening. Are they going to take my house away? Um, am I going to lose title to my um, land? Do I have to have a passport to get from Oklahoma City to Tulsa? Um, well, let me reassure you that your, your house is safe and your property is not going away. It's not going to impact that. But there are some issues about regulatory powers of, of tribes over non-Indians or over Indians within their reservation boundary areas. And those will either be sorted out in court or by intergovernmental agreement potentially we're having a little difficulty technically with mike's uh, uh internet connection we're going to go to a break now this is kent myers and mick cornett with our guest mike mcbride you're watching the verdict OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma loyal to you. Welcome back, Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. Uh, you're watching a verdict and our guest today is Mr. Mike McBride, Esquire. Choir, a partner of mine, and a true uh, sovereignty uh, tribal uh, law expert here in Oklahoma. Um, 
And Mick, where would you like to go from here? Well, let's let's switch to the uh, the case that was more recently um, um, addressed, and that would be uh, whether or not the uh, uh, the gaming compact, the gaming contract, had an automatic renewal or not, and then the courts have decided that it did automatically renew. So, Mike, what does this do going forward? Uh, it doesn't sound like it's going to change much. We're just a little bit over 24 hours since uh, Judge DeGiusti out of the Western District of Oklahoma Federal Court issued the, his order yesterday. It's only about 10 pages. There's only about four pages of analysis. Um, I understand that uh, Governor Stitt expended about $1.5 million to get the, this 10 page uh, opinion here. But basically the, the court ruled against Governor Stitt and ruled in favor of the Cherokee Nation, the Chickasaw Nation, Choctaw Nation. And then there were a number of tribes that were also interveners, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, the Scooby Creek Nation, Quapaw Nation, Delaware Nation, Seminole Nation, and the Wichita and affiliated tribes. Basically, D Judge DeGiusti held that it was a very simple contract interpretation. And looking at the model tribal state gaming compact, the question was, does the compact automatically renew or does it terminate? And there's a long paragraph that depending on which side you look at it, you could argue either way. But Judge mm -hmm. DeGiusti said it was clear and unambiguous and he didn't really have to resort to a lot of uh, case law or, or statutes to interpret it. And he said that it was clear that once certain actions took place by the state of Oklahoma, in renewing certain licenses and gaming activities, then the tribal state gaming compacts automatically renewed. So there's really not much left in this case. Um, Judge DeGiusti did ask the parties to get back with him in, in a couple of weeks and, and tell him if there's anything that is left to be de decided, but it doesn't appear that there is to me. So I think that, that it's a pretty decisive victory for uh, the tribes yesterday. Hmm. Let me ask you, do you uh, anticipate uh, an appeal by the state to, I guess, the Tenth Circuit? There could be. And uh, I know that the Citizen Potawatomi Nation had a an arbitration decision uh, that I was uh, involved with early on uh, that the state uh, appealed um, after they confirmed it in federal court. And, you know, it, you never can tell what, what courts are going to do, but it it does seem like it's a pretty clear statutory uh, contract interpretation uh, from this case, but, but that is a possibility. Mike, are there, are there, uh, it, it does seem like as you kind of referenced, there was some, um, I guess some, some double speak in that original uh, gaming contract. You could le read one paragraph and assume one thing and, and then read another paragraph and, and assume another. And when, you know, hence force the lawsuit to, to try and determine all that. Are there other things in that gaming contract that could be contested? Or do you think at this point, um, the, the judge uh, was, was, was clearly trying to put an end to the, to the legal action and, and, and allow the contract to continue? I don't think that there are other issues uh, in this particular lawsuit. Um, the tribes asked for a declaration and Governor Stitt asked for a similar declaration of what that paragraph meant. And the judge told him what it means. So I don't really think that there's much left there. Now, I, I mentioned that Citizen Potawatomi uh, arbitration that was confirmed in federal court and went to the Tenth Circuit. The Tenth Circuit ruled in that case that um, the dispute resolution clause in the compact was unenforceable. So there are some issues with the existing tribal state gaming compact framework um, about how to resolve disputes. And that now, will remain. Excuse me. This particular case was basically arguing about how much should uh, the uh, tribes pay to the state for the uh, privilege of gaming in Oklahoma. Is that a fair summary? I, I think that some people might say that, but really the issue was is whether the, the bargain would continue on as it was. Um, yeah. and, and the bargain was 
the tri whether the tribes would continue paying the exclusivity fees um, that the tribes in the state bargained for with each other back in 2004 and the, the memorialized by a vote of the people in, in 2005 with the tribal state gaming compacts. And there's been uh, over a billion dollars uh, paid um, to the state you know, over that time period for education under those exclusivity fees. And so, you know, it's, it's been a, a good relationship between the tribes and the state. I, I think that Governor Stitt wanted to try to increase um, the revenues. And, uh, and that, that's what uh, he was trying to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to, if, unless that decision changes the amount uh, paid by the tribes to the state under the original gaming compacts is going to remain the same. That's right. It's a sliding scale, and it's provided for you know, on, on gross gaming revenue. Well, Mike, does the original gaming contract, uh, does, does it address all the tribes, or are there still tribes out there that I assume are not allowed to, to conduct gaming uh, for one reason or another? Um, are they still covered by this gaming contract, or could they apply to, uh, uh, to, to start gaming uh, and, uh, and have to start over with the state of Oklahoma in a negotiation? Currently, as I understand it, there we have about 39 federally recognized Indian tribes within Oklahoma. I believe 33 of them have tribal state gaming compacts with the state of Oklahoma. Um, several negotiated new compacts with Governor Stitt the Oto Missouri tribe, the um, Comanche Nation, and the United Katua Band of, of Cherokee Indians. And they um, negotiated new compacts that were signed uh, and sent to the Department of Interior. And I believe that they were approved without a signature uh, by operation of federal law. They weren't denied. So those are in place, but there was also a, a decision uh, the week before last from the Oklahoma Supreme Court that said that um, the uh, those compacts were invalid because they invaded on the um, legislative branch and that um, they weren't properly approved and they, they had some provisions that, that were contradictory to um, existing law. So there is some uncertainty about those other three gaming compacts. Those compacts, those compacts you just referred to are different than the compacts that were resolved by the, the Judge DeGiusti's order. Correct. Uh, how has gaming in Oklahoma reopened? If you know, uh, are the tribes uh, uh, casinos open and functioning again? Yes, um, there was a time period where almost all the casinos across the country were, were shut, and Oklahoma is no exception. We have about 140 casinos and small gaming operations all the way up to the Windstar, which is one of the largest casinos in the world, and they were shut. Um, many of them started to uh, consider opening, and they uh, imposed um, careful COVID policies including social distancing, mask, and other um, frequent uh, washing and, and so forth to uh, help prevent the, the spread of COVID-19. Um, probably mid-May um, they started, and then by the 1st of June, most of the, or almost all of the, uh, the gaming facilities had reopened. Including Are they uh, I'm afraid I wanted to ask you another question, but I've got to stop myself because we're out of time. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Good luck to you. And uh, if you were involved in any of those cases, uh, congratulations. Uh, you Folks, you've been watching The Verdict with uh, Mike McBride and Mick Cornett. And uh, we'll be, Mick and I will be right back. It used to be okay in hospitals, 
It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. I really think people are so unaware of the number of kids waiting just in Oklahoma. And I think if more people knew that those children were out there waiting, you know, I think that just by the way we live our lives and the people we talk to, that, that maybe we can help encourage adoption from Oklahoma. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back, Kent Myers and Mick Cornett, uh, closing up this uh, episode of The Verdict. Mick, uh, what do you want to close with? Well, just a uh, hats off to Mike McBride for being able to answer a wide variety of questions that we threw at him. You know, yeah, when you're talking about legal matters, uh, you know, it'd be real easy to, to be concerned about the, having the particulars, but he had them. Uh, more information about Mike at the, the Crow Dunleavy website, crowdunleavy.com. I want to thank Mike for being on the show. Kent, you and I will see the guests uh, or see our, our, our viewers next week with another show with the verdict. So long, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>